to cover all of that. And so we just thank you for being a part of that. It's awesome. Thank you, Jesus. Father, tonight we love you and we are so appreciative of you bringing everybody here, getting us here safely. Father, we thank you for Coach Tony, JB being with us, and Father, for their hearts. And we know that, Father, I know through knowing them that you have touched their heart and that they are going to have a word in season for everybody. We just thank you in advance for all of the awesome things that are going to happen here this week. And Father, we submit ourselves to you. I know that people have come with all kinds of problems and needs. I know that people need to be healed. I believe there's people here that may not know you, Father. We want them to experience your presence and to know you during this week. Father, I pray for people that a financial breakthrough would come, that people would receive things, that marriages would be healed, that men would go back and their families would just be transformed. We open ourselves, Father, for everything that you have for us. Anything that you have for any of us here. Thank you, Jesus. I'm saying this in the name of the Lord, but the Lord is speaking to some men here, and you've been so occupied with things, and maybe even occupied with getting here. And right now, you just need to let go of some things, cast all of your care about your worries, your thinking about anything that's going on, and you need to focus, because God brought you here for a purpose, and that you are going to receive there's going to be lives transformed. God is already touching people. There's already something stirring on the inside of many men that are here right now. And Father, we just thank you. Holy Spirit, we welcome you to come and right now just take all of the care and the worry that people have, strife. There's some of you that came here with great strife, anger in your heart. And right now, I know that Man, this, we're, we're messing up the service, but I believe that the Holy Ghost is ministering and touching people. And there are some of you that have had anger and hurt in your heart, and God right now is just setting you free from that. Right now, there's just something happening. Don't hold on to it. Let it go. God is setting people free right now from bitterness, unforgiveness. You don't have to wait until the end of the service to receive prayer. You can receive right now. God is touching people's hearts. Thank you, Jesus. There's some men here that have just been bitter, angry for a long time. And God is setting you free right now. Praise God. The way you should respond to this is if that's you, you just need to open up your heart and say, Father, I receive it. Receive the love of God right now. Let God move and set you free. But God is changing people's hearts right now. Praise the Lord. You know what we desire is just to have people's lives changed. And it doesn't matter to me how it happens. It doesn't matter if it's through a message or through anything. If... God is touching you right now. Just allow Him to flow in your heart. There's somebody here that your wife is, is suffering physically in terrible situation and you came here with that weighing on your mind. And your heart's desire is not just for yourself but for your wife. God is touching her right now. Wherever she is, this is, the, this is the Lord responding to a prayer that you've prayed. There's a number of men in here right now that, that your wife is in need and God is just touching them wherever they are through you right now. You know, if that's you, I want you to stand right where you are and we're going to pray with you and we're going to release this power to flow right through you towards your wife. There's a number of men in here. The rest of you, let's put ourselves in agreement with these men. Father, in Jesus' name, whatever is going on, you said in 1 Corinthians chapter 7 that the wife could be sanctified by the faith of the believing husband. So right now, Father, we sanctify her. We set her apart 
We say that in the name of Jesus, whatever Satan is trying to do, if it's physical, if it's emotional, whatever is happening right now, Father, we stand on your word and we are standing here as men, as head of the family, and we are releasing your anointing right now. And we are pooling our faith, a collective anointing for every one of these men, for their wives. We release this anointing right now and we command cancer to depart in the name of Jesus. Cancer, we kill you right now. Death and life are in the power of the tongue and I kill cancer with my words in the name of Jesus. Every man standing for his wife, cancer, you have to leave right now in the name of Jesus. We take our authority and command you to die and every cancer cell in this body to die. And Father, I release life with my word and believe that right now life is flowing through their body and repairing all of the damage that cancer has done. Father, for emotional problems, there's a man here standing for his wife and she is just uh, emotionally a wreck, depressed, fighting discouragement. You've been trying to deal with it in the physical realm with hormones and different things, but man, here's God touching her and doing what no medicine or hormone could ever do. Here's the anointing of God touching her right now in Jesus' name. And there's also some men standing that your daughters are having problems right now. Here's the anointing of God flowing through you and touching these daughters. Father, we just lift up these families right now. And I thank you that before this meeting is over, that, Father, we are going to hear reports about what's happening back home or wherever they are. We thank you that the power of God is touching them and Satan, that your power is destroyed and that you have no control over them. None. We stand here as the authority in our home and say that this is over. It's not happening anymore. Father, we release this power. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. Right now, you need to just praise God and believe that God has done something. Even before you get a physical report, you need to believe that God has touched them right now. Hallelujah. Praise God. You can be seated. Well, the Lord is here. There's some people here that just recently, in the last few days, you've had a back problem. You've hurt your back some way or another. And right now, the power of God is touching people. Those of you that have a bad back, did we ever take the offering? You can pass the buckets. God, you know, it's not going to interrupt the Holy Ghost. People are afraid that the Holy Spirit will get offended. You know, in Jesus' meetings, man, people were over here were saying, you're of the devil, that's Beelzebub. And he had thousands of people out there for 10 hours. And you know, somebody had to go to the bathroom and they didn't have porta-potties. And yet, I mean, it was like a three-ring circus, and yet the peeling power of God flowed. So God's not offended by you passing a bucket. Don't get your mind off of the Lord. But there's people here that have had your back hurt in just the last few days, and you've got pain right now. God is healing you right now. Those of you that it, that fits you, if you've hurt your back in the last few days, if you've got something wrong, I want you to stand, and God's going to heal you right where you are. Right now, Father, in the name of Jesus, we command these pain to be gone. Whatever has happened, Father, if there's something damaged, if there's a muscle pull, or if it's something long term, whatever, in the name of Jesus, backs you be healed. Healed right now in the mighty name of Jesus. Right here is pain leaving people. There's somebody that wasn't able to bend over and like touch your toes. And you couldn't do it because of pain. Right now, you can begin to bend. You can begin to do things. You can move back and forth. There's people here that have been unable to lift your, shoulder, your arms because of your shoulders. Here's the healing power of God touching you right now. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. Pain, you be gone right now. And Father, I release this healing power of God. We receive these healings in Jesus' mighty name. Praise God. Man, I believe tonight is one of those nights that every person is healed. Jesus healed every single person. I believe that every person is being healed now in the name of Jesus. How many of you were having pain in your back and you've already felt the release? 
How many of you? Praise God, quite a few. How many of you, who could not bend over and touch your toes? And this is somebody that could bend over, you know. There's some people that couldn't bend over and touch their toes if they felt perfect because you got too much out here. But for those of you, for those of you who couldn't bend over and touch your toes before, how many of you are healed and can do that now? Where are you? I know that there's somebody in here because I called that out. That was the Holy Ghost. Where are you? Stand up. Wave at me. Oh, way back here on the back row. Praise the Lord. Isn't that awesome? Thank you, Jesus. And I was calling out a couple of things at one time, but who in here wasn't able to lift your arms like this? How about you, Chris? You good? Is that the arm you couldn't lift? Amen. And now he can lift his arm. Who else? There was a number of people. Here's another one over here. Here's some over here. Praise God. Father, we just thank you. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for loving us. Father, thank you for providing everything that we need. Thank you, Heavenly Father. And Father, we just worship you. We thank you. I praise you in advance for the awesome things that are taking place this weekend. We just give you praise. And thanks for it in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Praise God. Isn't that good? Hallelujah. Let's turn over to Philippians chapter 3. And you know, uh, JB and Tony and I, we don't sit here and discuss what we're going to minister, but the Holy Spirit seems to always just fit everything together, and so I believe it'll be really good. But the Lord laid some things on my heart tonight to share with you that I think it, it has the potential of making a huge difference in your life. Let me ask you this. What is, what is your number one hindrance? Think about that for a moment. And let me just give you some clues. It's not your wife. <laughs> some of you are probably thinking that. And it's not the devil. You know, there's a lot of people that just blame the devil for everything. And I'm all for blaming the devil for everything that we can blame him for. I'm not here to... Uh, improve his reputation at all. I'm against everything he's got. So I don't like the devil, but the truth is that the devil can't do anything to you without your consent and cooperation. That's quite a statement right there. And did you know our society today does not believe that? We are blaming anybody and everybody for what's wrong with us. People say it's because I was abused when I was a child. It's because I didn't have the money. I didn't have the education. It's because of the color of my skin. It's because of whatever. And we've got an excuse for nearly anything and everything. And yet that, that's not the problem. You can find people that have been raised in dysfunctional homes that men are just prospering. You know, I'm saying these things in love. Somebody might take this that I'm sitting here and criticizing people and stripping you of your excuses and saying uh, that it's your fault. Well, I am saying that. <laughs> but some people get condemned when I say things like this. But actually, this is to your benefit because if society is your problem, did you know you cannot change society? You can maybe influence a little bit of people and if other people do it and if all of us join together, together we can make a difference. But you can't change society. You can't change who your parents were. You can't change what your past experiences are. And as long as you are sitting there and blaming them for your problems, that makes you a victim, not a victor. You cannot be a victor and a victim at the same time. I can guarantee you out of this many men, we've got people in here that have had everything that has ever happened to you. There's somebody else in here that has had that same thing happen or worse, and yet they've been able to prosper. You know, we've got two examples here with J.B. and Tony who are men, African Americans, and there's a lot of people that are sitting here talking about their disadvantage. These guys are at the top of their game. Super Bowl winners and, and broadcasters and stuff. We've got people here that have broken the mold, that have prospered. It is not what other people say about you. It's not any of these other things. Your biggest enemy is yourself. Amen. <laughs> And a lot of people don't like this. 
Because like I said, it just strips you of your excuses. But I'm telling you, there are people that have overcome everything. Everything. And I know out of this many men that we're bound to have a lot of problems in here. There's people in here that, man, you are limping through life. You've had some serious things happen. And I'm not saying that you haven't had problems. That's not what I'm saying. But I'm saying that God is greater than any problem that has ever come your way. And what you are experiencing is not a deal killer unless you let it steal your faith and steal your vision. We've got people in here that have overcome the same things or worse things than what any of you have done. And I know that somebody right now is thinking, well, you don't know what's happened to me. Nobody knows the trouble I've seen. Nobody knows my sorrows. There's a song they wrote about that. But you know, the scripture says, 1 Corinthians 10, 13, it says, there is no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. If you think that your situation is unique and nobody has ever had your problem and therefore you exempt yourself from all of the answers that we're going to be sharing with you, well then you are deceit and right there you are cooperating with the devil. You're exempting yourself from what the word of God has to say. I'm here to tell you that God is bigger than any person's problem in here. I don't care if it's financial, if it's physical, if it's emotional, if it's relations, if it's in job, whatever. God is greater than whatever Satan has formed against you. It says in Isaiah chapter 54 verse 17, no weapon that is formed against you shall prosper. And every tongue that rises against you in judgment, you shall condemn. For this is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and their righteousness is of me, thus saith the Lord. God said that there's no weapon formed against you. None. And if you're saying, well, my weapon is different and I just can't overcome this, and if you're ready to give up, well, then you've set yourself in opposition to what God's Word says, and that allows the devil to keep you in bondage. You know, I know that what I'm saying, again, this is not what most people are ministering today. Most people come in and they want to get down and cry with you and tell you it really is bad. You know, at one of our minister's conferences, we had a couple come up, and I mean, they were just beat up. They were crying. It was bad. And Dave Duell, who was ministering with me, he, he was just a little bit different than most people. And Dave Duell came up to this couple, and he looked at them, and he says, don't feel bad. If I wasn't God, I'd be discouraged too. I thought it was hilarious. They didn't like it very well. Uh, it didn't go over very well. But that's the way that most people, most people want you to feel uh, sympathy for them. Sympathy is not going to get you well. It's not going to set you free. Now there's a place to have compassion on people, but I'm saying that sometimes compassion is telling a person, you can make it, get up and go for it, quit giving up. The Bible says no weapon formed against you will prosper. No weapon. And in the Hebrew there, if you look that word up for no weapon, it means no weapon. <laughs> it means that there is no weapon. Brothers, it doesn't matter what's happening. It doesn't matter if the doctor says you got cancer. I had somebody come to me last week and they had stage four cancer and they were asking me for prayer. And I said, that is nothing. I've seen thousands of people healed of cancer. Cancer is not hard unless you believe it's hard, unless you exalt the word of the doctor, unless you exalt what other people say above what God's word says. God's word says no weapon. No weapon formed against you will prosper. And every tongue that rises against you in judgment, you shall condemn. I believe that there's a connection there. No weapon formed against you will prosper. And then the next phrase, and every tongue that rises against you. Did you know words are weapons? When I was praying a while ago, I quoted Proverbs 18, 21. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. And... It's true that words are weapons. Words can kill you. Words have power in them. And when somebody tells you, you got cancer, you're going to die. Cancer doesn't have any power unless those words, unless you don't condemn them. 
It says, no weapon formed against you will prosper. Every tongue that rises against you in judgment, you shall condemn. You have to condemn it. You have to speak against it. You have to say, no, cancer, you will not destroy me. No poverty, you are not going to destroy me. No separation, divorce, you are not going to destroy me. You have to stand up and believe that God has given you power and authority. I don't know if I'll ever get to Philippians chapter 3, but I tell you what I'm saying is really good. That brothers, what happens is Satan just comes and he knocks on your door. He gives you some kind of problem. You go to the doctor and they tell you what it is. And then those words put fear in your heart. Those words take your faith away from you. And pretty soon you st people say, how are you? And you say, oh, well, the doctor says I got stage four cancer. I guess I'm going to die. You're hung by your tongue. You're speaking death out of your mouth. You got to condemn those words. Don't let somebody speak death over you. And most importantly of all, don't you speak death over you and over your situation. You know, it's one thing for other people to curse you. But the Bible says, Proverbs 26, 2, the curse causeless shall not come. If you don't open up, if you don't accept it, what the diagnosis of other people is, what the situation is, your finances or anything else, it will not overcome you unless you quit and accept those things. You know, I'm reminded of a testimony that Paul Milligan gave. He could give this much better than I will, but I've got the platform, so I'm going to give it for him. And <laughs> if I mess it up, well, he'll fi he's, he's going to minister tomorrow afternoon. He can fix this. But anyway, his business was in a critical situation. And I mean, it looked like that they were going to go under. And he did everything he knew how to do, and it just wasn't working. And finally, he went home and was talking to Patsy, his wife, and he was just complaining and saying we are going to make it. I think, Kenny, you were a part of this, weren't you? Oh, well, anyway, I, they'll fix this tomorrow. But it was something like this, that finally, after him just griping for a while and saying, it's over, we're, we're done, our business is through, Patsy just got up and says, if you're going to sit in my kitchen at my table and tell me that the word of God doesn't work, then I'm through talking to you. And she went to bed. <laughs> and he stayed up all night long mad at her, but as he thought and prayed about it, he realized that, you know what, he had let a circumstance destroy him. And again, I, I don't know all the details, but he got fired up, went in, called his staff together, Thousands of people, and or but his main staff, and he told them, we are going to overcome this, and from now on, nobody's saying anything different. And I mean, within a very short period of time, they got one of the largest contracts that they ever had. The ministry, I mean, the business pulled out. It's going strong today. And I tell you, in the natural, it was over, but it's not over until you say it's over. I tell you, I'm preaching to somebody. Somebody needs to hear this. There are some of you that I'm not saying you don't have problems, but I'm saying it's a weapon that has been formed against you and it will not prosper unless you agree with it, unless you give up. And I know some of you are thinking, but man, I've tried and it just hasn't worked. You know, I'm reminded when Jamie and I were first getting started, we were so poor we couldn't pay attention. And it was because of my... Uh, wrong thinking. I was taught that if you were called a minister that it, it was a sin for you to work a job because you were called into the ministry and you couldn't be, you couldn't work in the natural. And that's wrong. Until you get to where you're ministering full time, you shouldn't expect to live full time. But I didn't know that and because of it, we were struggling. I was pastoring a little church and during the midweek service, we only had like four or five people there and so we we came together and we were meeting at one of the church members uh, homes and I just told him I said you know what I hadn't got anything to share I said man I need you to minister to me and they thought I was joking and I said I'm not joking I said man I'm struggling and so anyway they turned on the 700 club and we started watching the 700 club during our midweek church service and I was just sitting there uh, lower than a gopher hole. I mean, I'd have had to 
look up to see the bottom of the barrel. It was just really discouraging. And anyway, Kenneth Copeland happened to be on, and he was hosting the 700 Club. And he was ministering from 1 John chapter 5, verse 4. This is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. And he says, if you're in faith, you're a world overcomer. If you are not overcoming, it's because you aren't in faith. And when he was preaching on this, I was thinking to myself, I didn't say this out loud. And I said, Kenneth, I've taught these exact same things. I know it. I've tried, but it just didn't work. And that's exactly what I thought. And he, it's like he heard what I was thinking. And he says, don't tell me it doesn't work. It says that if this is the victory that overcomes. And I, and I just was shocked. And I said, but I, I said this to myself. But I've tried it. He says, that's the problem. You're trying it instead of doing it. And every time I had a thought, he answered that thought. And I mean, I was just taken back. I was shocked. And I finally just, you know, I, I mean, it was like five or six different things. And he just answered every thought that I had. Finally, he just painted me into a corner where I had to admit that I was in unbelief. And that's the reason it wasn't working. Now that's not to say that I didn't have a problem. You know, this what the problem was at that time, this was when we were getting ready to have our first child. And uh, Jamie, when she was eight months pregnant, we went two weeks without anything but water. That's all she had for two weeks. I tell you, my wife is a blessing. Most wives would leave a person over something like that. And it was my fault because I wouldn't work a job because I was, I was called to the ministry. And you know, Jamie, praise God for Jamie. She never one time criticized me. She never said a word. One time I heard her praying. I walked by and she was praying and she says, God, I don't care what he says. If my baby ever goes without food, I'll go get a job. And that's the closest she ever came to complaining. She was complaining to the Lord about me, but she never said it to me. <laughs> Praise God. And uh, anyway, we were, we were getting ready to have our first child and I had no income. We hadn't eaten in two weeks. We were, we were drinking water only. And uh, we had to have $600 for the doctor bills at that time. And I hadn't, the very first year that Jamie and I were married, our total income was $1,253 for a year, for 12 months. And we had $100 a month rent, not including utilities and food. And the second year, it jumped all the way up to $2,400. So anyway, we didn't have any extra. And... Um, we were just a few days away from the, from the due date and we had to have $600 and I hadn't had $600 in three months. And it just looked impossible and yet Kenneth was saying this is the victory that overcomes the world. And you know what, I finally just kind of picked myself up and I didn't say anything to the people that night but boy the next day I said, Father, I am going to believe you and I know that you can overcome and I know that this will work. And I started believing God and started speaking the word. And I didn't feel like speaking the word. I felt like just saying, you know what, I tried and it didn't work. I, I wanted to just give up. I mean, after a while, how long do you stand? I have people ask me all the time when I pray for them, so how long do I stand? And I said, until it works. <laughs> Amen. Doesn't matter how long you stand. If you're, just, if, if you're only going to stand up to a point, the devil knows that. And he is going to fight you up until that point. But when you pass that point and say, I don't care what it takes. This is what the word says and I'm not moving off of it. That, the devil knows that he can't win once you get into that mindset. And he will flee from you. But as long as he can see any quit, any give up in you, he will continue to fight you. And so anyway, I just made this decision that, praise God, I'm going to stand. And within two days, we had that $600, and we were able to go in and have the child, and it worked out, and it was an absolute miracle. And actually, on the day of Joshua's birth, uh, Jamie went in at like 4.30 or something in the morning, and I stayed there. She, it only had an hour and a half delivery, 
It was supernatural. She fell asleep. I was praying over her. She was having pain and we were believing God for painless childbirth. And so she started having pain and I started praying in tongues over her. And then the nurse would come in and if a contraction happened while the nurse was in there, I'd kind of not say anything and it got worse. And finally, I just told the nurse, I said, I hadn't got time to explain to you, but I said, I'm praying. And I just started speaking in tongues. And anyway, the pain left and Jamie fell asleep and she delivered Joshua and they put him on her stomach and had to wake her up and tell her that she had had a child. It was awesome. So anyway, I stayed up there and because we missed a lot of the night's sleep, man, I needed to go home and get some rest. And I didn't have enough gas to get back home. And so I don't recommend this at all. <laughs> but desperate times call for desperate measures, amen. And so I just went to this service station and this is back when, you know, you uh, they used to come out and pump your own, pump the gas for you and stuff. But I just got out and I started pumping the gas and uh, filled up my car with gas. And I wasn't going to take the gas and leave and steal it, but I needed the gas, so I put it in my car. And I went in to tell them what I'd done, and I don't know what I was going to do. Ask for mercy, or I don't know. But I went in to tell the guy that, hey, I just filled my car up, and I hadn't got any money. And I went in to tell the guy, and when I got in there, it turned out that the guy in there had been a part of my Bible studies. And he says, what are you doing here? Because I lived about 30 or 40 miles away. And I said, well, my son was just born this morning. And I said, we were at the hospital, and, and I just had a baby boy. And he says, well, let me buy your gas as a gift for you. And I said, thank you. And praise God. But you know what? All that happened because I was in a situation that was way over my head and I was beyond the point. I had been standing for nine months and believing God and nothing had worked and it got right down to the wire. And my, my tendency was just to give up. But I'm telling you that unless you quit, you can't lose. And I'm not talking about just saying, all right, I'll hold on a little bit longer. I'm not talking about just tying a knot and holding on. You've got to be aggressive. You've got to reach out. You've got to stir yourself up or you'll sink to the bottom. And there's multiple ways of doing that. You know, one of them is to come to a men's conference like this. You're going to hear me and James and Tony encourage you and the Holy Spirit's going to speak to you and you'll be around other people that if you'll just open up and talk to them and ask them, you'll hear testimonies of people that have been through things. So... This is one way you do it is, you know, as we exhort one another while it's today. It's what the scripture says. But there's multiple things. And one of the most important things that you can do is to pray in tongues. Have you found Philippians 3 yet? Well, forget that. Go over here to Jude. Go over here to Jude. Chapter 1. There's only one chapter in Jude. And in verse 20 it says, But ye, beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost, keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. This says that you are supposed to pray in the Holy Ghost. And I could spend more time verifying this, but this is including speaking in tongues. When you were speaking in tongues, Isaiah chapter, I'd have to look it up, I think it's chapter 28, says this is the rest wherewith you may cause the weary to rest. And this is the refreshing. Speaking in tongues gives you rest and refreshing. It also says in 1 Corinthians chapter 14 that you build yourself up. Well, this right here says you build yourself up on your most holy faith. But in 1 Corinthians 14, it says you edify yourself. The word edify means to promote spiritual growth. So if you're in a situation where your faith has been challenged and you're struggling and if you're stressed out and if you're worried, one of the most important things you can do is pray in tongues. Praying in tongues is just like flipping a switch and turning on the power of the Holy Ghost. You know, the Holy Spirit is with you at all times. 
but he's not always active. Not because he doesn't want to be active, but he doesn't force himself upon you. You have to activate this. You have to flip the switch. And one of the ways you do that is to start speaking in tongues. And when you speak in tongues, it does things to you. I've actually read things in a uh, medical journal that they have done experiments on people who speak in tongues versus people that don't speak in tongues. And they have seen physical benefits from it. Specifically, one of them I read about, there's your frontal lobes right here. I don't know exactly all the details, but they, they show an MRI and your frontal lobes that aren't typically being used are active. They become super active when you pray in tongues. And something begins to happen when you pray in tongues. Matter of fact, you know, uh, I used to have a wireless mic when they first came out. I had one of the very first wireless microphones that they ever put out. And I was up at the uh, uh, Phipps Auditorium in Denver holding a meeting. And I was in an auditorium, you know, like this. this is a big auditorium. And I, I got up, turned on my wireless microphone, and it only went for 30 seconds or so. And then it just shut off. And so, uh, anyway, they, my, one of my guys came up and gave me a microphone, a handheld microphone, and he took my wireless. And as soon as he got it, it started working. So he handed it back to me. And as soon as I took it, it went off. So I handed it back. As soon as he got it, it started working. And finally, we stood in front of the people, and it would work with him. He'd hand it to me, and it would go off. It was just like clockwork. So anyway, I had a guy that had an oscilloscope and he hooked this thing up to an oscilloscope for 72 hours and that, batter, that uh, thing never failed. It worked perfectly. So I went to pick it up and he says, I don't know what's wrong, try it again. As soon as I put it on, it went off. So he hooked me up to the oscilloscope. <laughs> and did you know, it turns out that I admit a high frequency sound when I get to ministering and the squelch on these early uh, deals, it was on a frequency that it, was, it squelched it and it cut it off because of something that I admit. There's more going on around here than what we realize. And I'm telling you, when you pray in tongues, you may not have any physical way of proving it, but I can show you from the Word of God that you build up yourself on your most holy face. Something starts happening in the way you think. Your perspective on things begins to start changing. And it just does something. It's like turning on a motor, a, a power on the inside of you. And let me say this, that I'm not talking about just repeating, repeating one phrase for two seconds and then nothing happens. Sometimes it takes a while. Not because it takes a while for the Holy Ghost to get going, but your mind is so over here in unbelief. Did you know for you to, for you to speak in tongues over a prolonged period of time, 30 minutes or an hour... Did you know your mind has to be doing something? Now there are some people who I have sometimes thought that their mind is not turned on at all. But <laughs> the truth is you can't not think. You're always thinking. And when you're praying in tongues, your mind's got to be doing something. The Bible says, 1 Corinthians 14, 14, that when you pray in tongues, your spirit prays. Not your mind. But your spirit, it's coming out of your spirit, the part of you that has the mind of Christ. So when you're praying in tongues, you've got to do something with your mind. You can't just let it be idle. And so you have to start focusing upon God. If you continue to think about your problem, if you continue to let the discouragement and all the negative thoughts that have been bogging you down, if you continue to think on that, you'll quit speaking in tongues. I don't know how many of you have ever tried this. But I've prayed in tongues one time 17 hours without a break trying to overcome some things that were fighting against me. And I, there's been hundreds of times I've prayed in tongues three and four hours at a time. I, I routinely go walk in an hour or an hour and a half at a time and I'll pray in tongues usually for the entire time. And so I pray in tongues a long period of time and I can tell you that you can't keep, you can't continue to pray in tongues and think about your problem. As a man thinks in his heart, that's the way things will be. 
And if you just start praying in tongues, not for one second, one phrase, but if you just say, I am going to focus on God, I am going to let the Holy Spirit take control of me and start speaking in tongues, it just starts doing something to you. Your holy faith gets built up. And there's probably men in here that don't even have the Holy Spirit. We're going to give you an opportunity to receive this because God wants you to have this more than you want to have it. But there's many men in here that have the gift of the Holy Spirit in praying in tongues and you don't use it. And I'm saying this by the Spirit of the Lord that there's some of you in here that have been baptized in the Holy Spirit for years and it's been years since you've spoken in tongues or since you've spoken in tongues any length of time. And yet you're trying to deal with problems and yet you're dealing with it in nothing but the flesh. When you start praying in tongues, it makes you get into the spiritual realm. Or I can guarantee you, you'll quit. You cannot pray in tongues a long period of time and still stay carnal. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And if your heart is focused on your problems and if you're thinking about how bad it is and discouragement, it will stop you. You just can't do it. For you to pray in tongues over a prolonged period of time, it makes you focus on what God is saying. It makes you get into your most holy faith is what it says. You building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. And the next verse, it says, it keeps you in the love of God. Brothers, everything that we need comes through God's love for us. Galatians 5, 6 says, faith works by love. Faith it's easy if you are walking in the love of God. But if you aren't in relationship, if you aren't feeling the love of God, well, then most people just go through the motions, you know, saying and doing some of the things that they've been told to do. But when you're in love, when, man, you are feeling the love of God, it is not hard to believe God. Faith works by love. And, man, when you start praying in tongues, it builds you up and keeps yourself in the love of God. I have so many people come to me and they say, look, I know that God loves me, but I just don't feel His love. Would you please pray for me that I would feel the love of God? No, I won't do it. Because you know what that is? You're saying, well, it's God's fault. And so ask God to pour out His love. God poured out His love through Jesus. Romans chapter 5 says the love of God is shed abroad in our heart. God is not like this because somebody's missed it. You haven't lived holy enough. You haven't done what's right. And He's not holding back. God is like this. He's trying to get His love to you. He totally messed up my message tonight because He loves you and wants to get you built up. God is trying to reach you. It's never God that you have to say, God, pour out your love in my life. It's you that has stopped the love of God because you are keeping your mind focused on your problems. You're listening to other people. Just like we heard some testimonies tonight about how people were saying that you're going to die. That's what Dave was saying coming here. There's people trying to convince you to do things. There's people that have spoken against you. And the worst thing is, is when somebody else says all these negative things, then you adopt it and you start saying it about yourself. And because of that, you're focused on those things. You've got to get beyond that and you've got to get into the love of God. And there's multiple ways of doing it. But one of the quickest, easiest, most beneficial ways is just to start speaking in tongues. And build up yourself on your most holy faith. You know what? I have compassion for everybody, but I don't believe that most of us have an excuse, especially if you're born again, baptized in the Holy Spirit. We don't have an excuse for being defeated. We might have reasons, but God has equipped us. And if you've got the Holy Spirit, man, this, the Holy Spirit is what does everything. God's Holy Spirit brooded over the waters and created everything. The Holy Spirit is, is the power of God. Zephaniah, or Zechariah 4, 6, I think it is, says, Not by might, nor by power, but by my Spirit, says the Lord. We've got the indwelling power of the Holy Spirit. You know, just last night I was studying about Samson. And I was reading in Judges about Samson. 
And people think Samson was just this huge hunk of flesh that, man, he was strong. He made the power team look pitiful in comparison. That wasn't true. If Samson was this Herculean looking man with huge muscles, nobody would have wondered what's the secret of his power. <laughs> Samson just looked like me. He looked like anybody. He wasn't a strong guy. It, every time something happened, it says the Spirit of the Lord came upon him and he slew this lion like it had been a lamb and tore it to pieces because the Spirit of the Lord came upon him. The Spirit of the Lord came upon him and he walked out and took the gates of the city and the bars that the gates were on. The gates were for protection. It doesn't say how big they were, but they were there to protect. They had to be big. And he picked them all up and carried them over half of a mile and put them on top of this hill. Spirit of the Lord came upon him. Did you know that same spirit came upon David? David wasn't a great man. Matter of fact, the Bible says he was ruddy and with all of a beautiful countenance. David wasn't a strong man, but the spirit of might came upon him and he killed a lion and a bear with his bare hands. It was the Spirit of God that enabled them. And brothers, I'm telling you, if you are just trusting in yourself and trying to figure things out on your own, you might be able to win some battles, but ultimately you'll lose. We've got to learn to get beyond ourselves and to draw on the supernatural power of God. And I'm telling you, that's what the power of the Holy Spirit. Jesus said in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, but you shall receive power after that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you and you shall be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. The Holy Spirit empowered them. You know, prior to that time, uh, not only Peter, but every one of the 11 apostles that were left, every one of them denied Jesus and ran. But after they received the Holy Spirit, they stood boldly and they spoke to the Pharisees and the chief priest and said, you're the ones who crucified him and let a murderer go. They were bold, bold. And they were so bold, it says that the scribes and Pharisees, the chief priests took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. That's the difference that the power of the Holy Spirit made. And I'm telling you, brothers, there are some of you in here that have the baptism of the Holy Spirit and yet you don't use it not saying that to condemn you, but to enlighten you that, man, when you get your back against the wall and nothing is working, start praying in tongues. Release this power. Build yourself up on your most holy faith. You know, when we built a building down in Colorado Springs, we had a little 15, uh, 14,600 square foot building that my ministry was occupied in. And the Lord spoke to me January the 31st, 2002 and told me I was limiting God by my small thinking. So I started dreaming big. And we had outgrown that 14,000 square foot space. And so we started looking for other things. And I remember coming home from a trip and Jamie had looked at a building that was 30,000 square feet. And uh, she took me to see it. And she says, this will last us the rest of our life. And I knew that, man, my vision was bigger than that. And I hadn't even communicated it to my wife. Because, you know, after you get... I, in the beginning, I used to say these big things about that some, someday I'd be reaching people all over the world. But, you know, I had four people coming to church. And we were not eating and I didn't have any money. And, and after people laugh at you and do things, after a while, you just quit speaking your vision. And I'd gotten to where I didn't even, my wife didn't even know how big my vision was. And the Lord used that to show me that I was really limiting him. So I started speaking big. I started believing God. And anyway, the very first thing we did was move from 14,600 square feet into a 110,000 square foot building. And it was huge compared to what we had done. And the payments were huge. Did you know that the uh, utilities on that building were around eight or $9,000 a month? I'd never paid more than a couple of hundred dollars a month. And we went to eight to 9,000. I just asked Paul this week or 
I think it was this week. And anyway, we now, we have to pay about $26,000 a month just for electric and water and um, gas. $26,000 a month is my utility bills. What a deal. So anyway, I took a huge step of faith and I bought this building uh, in Colorado Springs for $3.2 million. But then it was an old warehouse and we had to remodel it and it was going to cost $3.2 million to remodel it. So I took out a loan for the initial thing and then um, we tried to get this construction loan in for nine months. The bank told me, oh, it's already approved. We would have never given you that $3.2 million if we didn't plan on giving you the construction loan because it's useless to you until you get it done. And so they said, oh, you'll have it next week. That went on for nine months. And after nine months, I was meeting with them and I said, look, we need that money because the Bible college was, it was just at a chokehold position. We couldn't grow where we were in this little 14,000 square foot building. And uh, they, they said, well, it's been so long now. Why don't we just get a new appraisal and start the whole process over? And when they said that, I just thought another nine months. And I said, no, this isn't right. And so I said, let me pray about it. And I went home and I, I started praying. I said, God, I need an answer. And I stood on the scripture that says, 1 Corinthians 2.16 that we have the mind of Christ. I don't believe it's out there and that you have to just ask the Lord and he has to just somehow or another speak to you in an audible voice or send something to you. In your spirit, you have the mind of Christ. Colossians 3.10 says, put on the new man which after God is, is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. 1 John 2.20 says, we have an unction from the Holy One and we know all things. Not some things, but all things. I believe it was in here in my spirit, but it wasn't in my head. I needed to draw it out. How do you do that? It says in 1 Corinthians 14, 14, when you pray in tongues, your spirit prays, the part of you that has the mind of Christ. And then 1 Corinthians 14, 13 says, if you pray in tongues, pray also that you may interpret. So based on those things, I said, God, I just need a word from you. Something's not working right. And so I started walking. I got this trail that I walk on. And I didn't get more than 100 yards down this trail, praying in tongues, believing that I was speaking forth the hidden wisdom of God, saying, God, give me an interpretation. Show me what I need to do. And I mean, within 100 yards, all of a sudden I had come back to my memory a prophecy that had been given to me over two years before. And this prophecy was talking about the expansion and it says, you aren't going to need to take out a loan for this building because you have a bank. And I remember when they said that, I thought, what bank do I have? And the next uh, phrase was, your partners are your bank. Your partners, you can't build more than your partners can pay for cash. And when I had that, I thought, is this the interpretation? Is this what the Lord's telling me, that I shouldn't even be taken out alone? That my partners could do this? And so, man, I went back up to the house and I started figuring things out. And at the rate we had saved money, I figured out that I would have been over 120-something years old by the time we accumulated $3.2 million. And I said, this in the natural can't happen. And God, if I commit to this, this is going to be a big deal. So I prayed about it for over a week. And finally, the more I prayed about it, I just kept feeling like this was God speaking to me. And so based on that, I went in and told my manager, I said, look, if they offer me all of the money that I need tomorrow, I'm not taking it. I said, God's going to pay for this debt free. And sure enough, the next day they came to me and they said, you know what? You've been approved for $4 million. And I said, too late. <laughs> and I turned it down. Which in the natural would have killed the ministry because we, we've never brought in that kind of money. But did you know in 14 months, we brought in $3.2 million and did that debt free. And then we've built that building over there, 72,000 square feet. This one, 150,000 square feet. We did all of this debt free. 
we did take out a loan on this uh, parking garage, which I hadn't got time to explain to you. I didn't want to do it. I did it. But anyway, we're going to get it paid off quickly. But we've done $75 million worth of buildings in six years debt-free above my normal expenses. And the only reason I'm saying this is to say that, look, I was so poor that I couldn't pay attention. I couldn't pay for a child to be born, $600. I couldn't pay for gas in my car. But praise God, this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. And I just stirred myself up. And a big part of it was praying in tongues. And now we have seen millions and millions and millions come in. And sometimes people think, well, you're a preacher and people just give to you. I know lots of preachers that don't have millions. That's not true. I can guarantee you there's preachers right in here that if I was to have them stand up and say, do you have a financial crisis? We would have a number of preachers standing up. Just because you're a preacher does not mean you got money. I'm telling you that this is the power of the Holy Ghost and I have had to stand and fight and control my thoughts. As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. Proverbs 23, 7. If you are depressed and defeated and discouraged, I love you. I'm aware Satan is going out forming weapons, trying to overcome you. I'm not condemning you, but I'm trying to build you up and encourage you that if you are being overcome, it's because you haven't kept your mind Stayed upon the Lord. Isaiah 26, 3, the Lord will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed upon him. How do you keep your mind stayed upon God? Again, multiple ways, but one of them is just praying in tongues. Man, you ought to be praying in tongues a lot. The Apostle Paul said, 1 Corinthians chapter 14, he was talking to the church and he says, I pray in tongues more than you all. You know, that's like me saying, I pray in tongues more than all of you in here, all put together. I pray in tongues more than all of you. I don't know that I can say that, but that's what the Apostle Paul was saying to this group. If there was 100 people or 200, I pray in tongues more than you all. I wonder if that was part of him getting the revelation that even the Apostle Peter says, our beloved brother Paul says, some things that are hard to be understood which those that are unlearned and unstable wrestle with as they do other scripture. Peter called Paul's writing scripture. Where did he get all of this from? He spent three and a half years in the desert of Arabia praying in tongues. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, he says, I'm speaking the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom of God, which the princes of this world don't know. And then in that same book, 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 2, when you pray in tongues, you are speaking forth the mysteries of God, exactly what he said he was doing. Paul prayed in tongues and asked God for revelation, and that's how the word of God opened up to him. I'm telling you, God gave us so much power. We've got the same power that created the heavens and the earth. We've got the same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead. You've got the same power that he says you would receive power when the Holy Ghost has come upon you. That we've got reasons why things don't work, but we do not have an excuse. You've got the baptism of the Holy Ghost. You speak in tongues. Man, you speak in tongues. You can build yourself up on your most holy faith. You can receive revelation. You can interpret what you're saying. Your spirit knows exactly what the answer to your problem is. There is just no excuse. There are reasons why things don't work, but there is no excuse. God has equipped us. You are loaded. You have more than what you need to be able to accomplish God's instructions. And I'm telling you, God speaking, there's some people here that have just come discouraged. And you're like me, saying, well, I tried that. Quit trying and just do it. Amen. Well, I, I, yeah, and whatever your excuse is, just do it. You've got the power of God. And praise God, we're going to build you up and encourage you. And if we have to, we're going to have you bend over and give you a good swift kick in the rear. <laughs> but we're going to help you get going, praise God. And brothers, we need it. And this world is going to hell in a handbasket. Things are going weird. They even are killing children now that have been born in a botched abortion and the child is alive outside of the mother's womb, which there's no way they can claim this part of the woman's body and yet they just passed a 
thing to let the child die. That's evil. It's demonic. We need somebody that'll stand up and begin to start doing things. And you can't do that if you're letting your problems overcome you. Only a free man can set another person free. You need to start walking in victory. You need to get healed so that you can start preaching healing and seeing people walking in the power of God. You need to get prosperous so that you can start being a blessing and prospering other people. You need to start operating in joy so that you can be a witness and a testimony. I'm telling you, I believe that God's going to stir you up this week. God wants you to begin to start walking in the supernatural power of God and manifesting His will to other people. And already tonight, we've seen, I don't even know, but there was dozens of people that have already experienced healing. I believe that many of you are going to get testimony from your wives and daughters that miracles have happened as you prayed for them. Man, we're making a difference. You need to stand up and believe God. Amen? So I want to ask you tonight, if you don't have the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and if you don't speak in tongues, man, what a great opportunity for you to receive that. And I know some people think, well, they don't preach that in my church. Well, that's the reason I'm not in your church. <laughs> that's the reason we had to bring you here. But I'm telling you what, everything you see, $75 million worth of buildings done in six years is because of speaking in tongues. It's because of God that God used speaking in tongues. Man, there's times that I, I've walked every inch of these buildings when there was just steel here, when this was all dirt and stuff. And I've walked these places and I've prayed in tongues when they put in those seats. I've walked over, I've touched every seat in this place. I have prayed in tongues over everything going on here. And so, yes, it's God's power, but it didn't just happen automatically. God said he's able to do exceeding abundantly above all we ask or think. And most people put a period right there. Ephesians 3.20. But it says according to the power that works in you. God can only move to the degree that you are believing and trusting him. And he says you receive power. After that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. I'm telling you, you can stir up the power of God. You can release the anointing of God by praying in tongues. If you don't have this gift of praying in tongues, you need it. And somebody says, do you have to speak in tongues? No, you don't have to speak in tongues. You get to speak in tongues. It's a privilege. It's an honor. I'm not speaking in tongues right now. I can control it. I can speak in tongues if I want to. Somebody said, so you can just turn the Holy Spirit on and off? No, he's on all of the time. It's me that's on and off. And anytime I turn me on, this motor's running on the inside and he will give me the ability to speak in tongues. So God doesn't force you to speak in tongues. Some people come down here and they just open up their mouth and wait on God to force them to pray in tongues. It doesn't work that way. It says in Acts chapter 2 verse 4, it says, They spoke with other tongues as the Spirit gave them the utterance or the inspiration. It's just like me ministering tonight. I believe that God has spoken to me through, through me tonight. I believe that God has spoken directly to people tonight. But if I would have stood up here and said, Oh God, just let it be you. Let it be pure Holy Spirit. I don't want to say anything. You just speak through me. And then if I opened up my mouth and waited on God to make it talk, you wouldn't have heard a word. He didn't force me to say a thing I said. That's the reason. It was me talking. It came out in Texan. <laughs> Because it's me talking. I was talking. But I believe it's inspired by the Holy Spirit. Speaking in tongues is like that. The Lord doesn't force you to speak in tongues. But if you start, then the Holy Spirit will flow through that. And you know when a little baby first starts talking, it doesn't sound like it's a real language. And it's really not. They make these sounds and the dad says, oh, he said daddy. But nobody else would even recognize it. It's not clear, but you know what? That's the way it is speaking in tongues. When you're still thinking, is this just me? Well, it is you, but it's not just you. It's you under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. It may not be fluent. It may not be all of these things, but you get started and just like a little child, you keep speaking and after a while, you can't shut them up. 
And it's the same thing with speaking in tongues. I'm telling you, you need the baptism of the Holy Spirit. If you don't have it, you need the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And this is for every person in here. Somebody says, well, I'm a Baptist. Well, I was a Baptist until I got the baptism of the Holy Spirit and they asked me to leave. But you can be a Baptist and speak in tongues. You can be a Catholic and speak in tongues. It doesn't matter where you come from. You need this baptism of the Holy Spirit. Is there anybody in here that would just be bold enough to say, you know what, I don't have it, but I receive what you're saying, I want it. If that's you, I want you to hold your hand up. Just hold your hand up right where you are. Up in the balcony all around. Praise the Lord. Man, there's a lot of people. You know, if you raised your hand or if you were supposed to raise your hand but didn't do it, would you get up out of your seat and come right down here and we want to pray with you and we want to help you to receive this baptism of the Holy Spirit. Just come forward right here and we're going to pray with you. There was people up in the balcony that raised your hand. If that's you, you can come on down. You can either go out those doors and come down or you can come down these stairs on the side. But come down here. Man, we're going to pray with you and this is going to transform your life. Isn't this awesome? You know, I got born again when I was eight years old and I was truly born again because the very next day I went to school and my friends could tell I was different. And they asked me what happened and I told them I... I got made Jesus my Lord. And they made fun of me in the third grade for being Christian. So I know I was born again. But it was ten years later when I received the baptism of the Holy Spirit and started speaking in tongues. And my life changed more outwardly through the baptism of the Holy Spirit than it did through the initial forgiveness of sins. Now I'm not saying that forgiveness of sins isn't important. Getting born again is absolutely essential. But that's like the front door. The baptism of the Holy Spirit will release what God puts on the inside of you. And I actually changed more outwardly through the baptism of the Holy Spirit than I did through getting born again. So this is going to change your life. I believe that you're never going to be the same. But you've got to be born again before you can receive the Holy Spirit. The Bible says that Jesus is the one who gives the Holy Spirit. He will give, it says in Luke eleven thirteen. how much more shall the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? So you've got to receive the giver before you receive the gift. If you haven't been born again first, you must receive salvation is the first step. You can't, he, you can't receive this gift of the Holy Spirit until first of all you receive salvation. So if there's anybody down here who isn't absolutely certain that you are born again, I need to pray with you first. And right before I have you, uh, let me know if that's you. Let me just say that there's a lot of people that just assume they're a Christian because they're a relatively good person. But did you know that good people don't go to heaven and bad people don't go to hell? Only forgiven people go to heaven and people who don't accept forgiveness go to hell it doesn't have anything to do with your actions it has to do with whether or not you've made Jesus your Lord so if you're trusting in your goodness you need to quit doing that and you need to make Jesus your Lord going to church won't make you a Christian any more than sitting in a garage would make you a car <laughs> if you're a car get in a garage for your own protection but it doesn't make you a car. If you are a Christian, you need to go to church. But going to church doesn't make you a Christian. So is there anybody down here who's not sure whether or not you've ever really done that and made Jesus your Lord? And, and you want to make sure. You want to pray with me and make sure. If that's you, I want you to raise your hand. Here's one over here. Anybody else? Here's another one. A number of people. Praise the Lord. Awesome. Praise God. Awesome, awesome. All right, it says in Romans 11, or Romans chapter 10, verse 9, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, that's more than just saying the words, it means that you are turning your life over to the Lord. Doesn't mean you'll be perfect, because you can't be perfect. There's plenty of forgiveness, but you have to be willing to make Jesus your Lord. So if you will confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, 
you shall be saved. It's that simple. Jesus has already paid for your sins. It's not a matter of will he forgive you. He has forgiven you. Will you accept his forgiveness? So I'm going to lead you in a real simple prayer. And I want everybody in here to pray with me so they won't feel like we're just listening to them. And as I lead you in this prayer, if you will pray this with me out loud, repeat after me, and mean it from your heart, then you'll be born again. Isn't that a good deal? God's already died for your sins. He wants you to be saved, but you have to make Him the Lord of your life. So let's pray this. Let's say, Father, Father, I'm sorry for my sin. I I believe Jesus died to forgive my sins. And I receive that forgiveness. forgiveness. Jesus, I make you my Lord. Lord. I believe that you are alive. alive. That you now live in me. me. I am saved. saved. I am forgiven. forgiven. In Jesus' name. name. Amen. Amen. You believe that? Amen. 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 Did you believe that? You know, if you believe that, then according to the Word of God, you are saved. And right now, you are a completely different person. You may look the same on the outside, but on the inside, you became a brand new person. The Bible says you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And so that's significant. He says He created you to be a dwelling place for His Holy Spirit. So now that everybody down here has made Jesus their Lord, every one of you was created to be a dwelling place for the Holy Spirit. So the Lord would never deny you the Holy Spirit. Some people think that you've got to get rid of all of your sin before you can receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. If you could get rid of your sin and overcome all of your problems on your own without the Holy Spirit, then you wouldn't need the Holy Spirit. If you are a mess, if you've got sin in your life, you're the very person that God's wanting to fill with the Holy Spirit to give you power so you can overcome. So don't let anything stop you from believing. It says, if you being evil know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? So we're just going to pray a real simple prayer. We're going to ask, I'm going to speak over you. In a sense, what we're going to do is open up the doors of our heart and welcome him in. He won't force himself on you. And we're just going to ask and believe that we receive the Holy Spirit. And then I'm going to ask all of our brothers out here that already have the baptism of the Holy Spirit and speak in tongues. We are going to start speaking in tongues because the Bible says when you pray in tongues, you are giving thanks well. So we are going to start praising God and thanking God for giving you the Holy Spirit. And when we do that, I want you to quit asking and believe that he did what he promised he'd do and I want you to start thanking him. You know, like when somebody sticks a gun in your back and you stick your hands in the air and you go, I surrender. What we're going to do is just, Father, I thank you. The Bible says when you lift up your hands in the sanctuary, you bless the Lord. So we're going to thank him that he gave you the Holy Spirit. We're going to pray in tongues, and you're going to pray in tongues with us. Amen? Amen. So, Father, I thank you for all of these. Thank you for these that were born again as they prayed just now. Father, thank you for all of our sins being forgiven and that we are now a brand new person. Old things have passed away. All things have become new. Thank you, Father, that we now are the temple of the Holy Spirit. So, Holy Spirit, we open up the doors of our temple And we welcome you to come in. Right now, we ask for the baptism of the Holy Spirit, for this power to come into our life right now. Holy Spirit, come and fill us, every person down here. I release this anointing in the name of Jesus. Holy Spirit, come and fill us. Well, right here is the anointing of the Holy Spirit just flowing among us right now. God is touching your life. Father, we thank you. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, let's get those hands in the air. Start thanking God. And those of you that know how to pray in tongues, let's worship the Lord as we speak in tongues right now. And as we speak in tongues, you join in with us. Talk out loud. Don't just do it in your mind. Talk out loud. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah.
imbro sin de la cámara inde que era vocuro samabrente. Be bold with it. Don't worry about what it sounds like. Don't just listen to yourself. Put your mind on God. Begin to start worshiping the Lord. Talk out loud. Somebody's saying, well, it doesn't sound like a language. Did you know that there are languages that are nothing but clicks of the tongue? There's a language that's nothing but whistles. Don't worry about what it sounds like. Just let it flow. And as you get strong in it, it'll sound like a language. Tindaro hombre e sin de la cabra tomba. You can put some emotion behind it. It doesn't have to be monotone. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Man, you're praising God. You're bypassing your brain. You're bypassing all of the doubt that you've got and you're praying right out of your born-again spirit that has the mind of Christ. You're stirring up the gift that is in you. You're building yourself up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you. Father, fill. We thank you that you have filled all of these people with the power and the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Praise you, Father. Hallelujah. Praise God. You know, let me have your attention here for just a minute. Sorry to interrupt you, but whether you spoke in tongues right now or not, God gave you the Holy Spirit because He said He would. When I first prayed for this, I didn't speak in tongues immediately, but that's because I was a Baptist. And I'd been taught that this was of the devil, and so I was just waiting on God to make it come out. Kind of like when you throw up, that you can't stop it, it just comes out. And that's not the way. And it took me three and a half years before I spoke in tongues. But I wrote all of this in a book, and uh, I, I believe I probably had more problems speaking in tongues than most people. And uh, I have given this book out to tens of thousands of people, and we've had literally thousands of people that came down just like you did, that didn't pray in tongues immediately, but as they read the book and got their faith built up, then they were able to do it. And now they speak in tongues and they're flowing in the power of the Holy Spirit. So I want to give every one of you a book that will explain. The first half of the book is about what true salvation is. And for those of you who prayed to make Jesus your Lord, it'll explain that. The second half of the book is about the baptism of the Holy Spirit and this gift of speaking in tongues. So I want to give that to every one of you. We've got Mark... Jones right here. He's the man here with his Bible in the air. And are you going to take him somewhere? All right, so we'll just go right out there. He's got a book that he's going to give you. And also, if you have a question about this or if you need prayer for healing or anything, Mark will uh, help you. But we want you to get this book because what happened to you is more important than what you realize right now. You need to understand this. So if you would, just follow Mark and he'll get you that book. Praise the Lord. Awesome. You're welcome. You're welcome. Praise the Lord. Man, isn't this awesome? That's a great way to start the conference. Man, I tell you, these wives, girlfriends, families are going to be thrilled when these guys go back full of the Holy Ghost instead of full of the devil. Amen. Hallelujah. I want to ask our prayer ministers, if they would, to come down here. These are Bible college students that have been through training. And, you know, we have seen, uh, I couldn't even tell you, but many, many miracles. I talked to one man this afternoon whose wife was healed of things. He was healed of things. I mean, their whole life has been transformed. And it wasn't me that prayed for him. It was these people right here. They came down. 
And I tell you, these guys are stronger than horseradish. So they are full of the Word of God. They're ready to pray with you. If you need prayer for anything, you know, we saw a lot of miracles happen tonight as I was praying over things, but there may be other things that I didn't call out. You don't have to just live with it. You don't have to wait until somebody else...
đi bao câu hứa mình còn cho nhau quên đi bao nỗi đau mình dành ngày xưa em đã vội quên đi những lời hứa ngày nào người dòng nước mắt em đã vội rơi anh không nên bay anh anh cứ nên vào điên rồi anh như say nụ mắt môi anh như chỉ còn muốn em bên cạnh như em phố xa rồi anh chỉ muốn em cạnh đây thôi không muốn em ở bên đời chỉ muốn em anh bên người oh, oh, oh. người đã gỡ bữa đi xa trong cơn mưa chiều vội vã người đã bước bên anh khi cơn mưa qua gần vội vã em đã quên ở mãi sau ngày yêu mơ về chẳng còn lại gì những người mà nữ mà ăn rơi em kiên còn tìm như trời vai trong chiều Chưa ta chúng con giữ nhau Chẳng để giữ lấy em khi cơn mưa về đến Và chẳng cần nhau khi anh với em cùng một đêm trôi Em ơi ta còn gì nữa đâu một cơn mưa ngày hôm qua Ta còn lại gì nữa đâu khi em bây giờ đã xóa đi Xóa hết cơn mưa kia vẫn cần rơi Và anh như đang ngồi chơi oh, oh. Em ơi, đừng kiến trái tim này quên như một đường điên qua Em như một người điên anh có vẻ I feel like I'm losing my mind Is everybody in the world blind? Please Lord give me a sign, a sign I feel like I'm losing my mind Is everybody in the world blind? Be the greatest. Everybody on the face shit. I look around and feel like everybody is the fakest. I make this every day and I'm impatient. Hoping one day I blow up from the basement. Statement, the top is so vacant. I don't hear shit that I think is amazing. Waiting for my day when I'm playing. Sold out shows for a thousand faces. Hey, give me that crown. Getting my way in to be put down. It ain't your place. All this my town. If I want that shit, then I'll get it right now. I'm losing it. The noose it fits. I'm losing shit. A stupid myth. You choose to live or choose to dip. You choose to fight or lose your grip and lose a gift. Oh. I feel like I'm losing my mind Is everybody in the world blind? Please Lord give me a sign, a sign I feel like I'm losing my mind Is everybody in the world blind? Please Lord give me a sign, a sign There's no mercy in this world, just hunger, thirsty persons In different versions, each new update, that shit worsens Why? Pull back the curtain and you'll see the different vermin We all have different burdens that all seem to cause disturbance Yo, so do me a favor, don't treat me like a neighbor Don't need the different flavors of your problems just to savor I've got my own issues, I need a comb to get through Don't need to groan with you, just go get your own tissue I feel like I'm losing my mind Is everybody in the world blind? Please look